inside the green, you know, inside the protected area of Baghdad. I mean, not, they're not building that in order to tear it down. Uh, the major air bases that are building, that are being built around uh, uh, Iraq, are huge facilities, and they are not being built with the intent of tearing them down. And they're supported by the Democrats; they fund them. Uh, and the idea it clearly is to try to figure out some way to establish a client government which will be uh, be able to function but, but uh, much like the government in Chechnya functions you know they're Chechens they have their own security forces or like say the Vichy government under the Nazis it was a French government French security forces you know French police uh, French officials and so on the Germans sort of hanging around in the background actually it's pretty much the way Russia, the Russians most run, ran most of Eastern Europe it was Czech troops, uh, Polish troops, and so on and so forth. So try to set up something like that, the traditional imperial structure, but making sure that it's a base for U.S. power and that the U.S. controls it. And we don't really have to debate this any longer because it's public. Uh, not much of a fuss was made about it. In fact, I don't even think it was reported. But in November, last November, uh, there was a declaration, uh, a, an agreement by George Bush and what's called the Iraqi government, uh, which is uh, you know, a little enclave inside the green zone, never gets outside it, which we call the Iraqi government, the client government that follows our orders. So an agreement was made between them, uh, which is interesting. It uh, permits the US to maintain effectively permanent military uh, bases and operations inside Iraq. Uh, all kind of pretexts, but that's what it amounts to. And rather brazenly, to my surprise, uh, it says that the Iraqi economy must be open to foreign investment, uh, privileging U.S. investors. That's unusual. It's unusual to see such a brazen statement of crass imperialism. You know, the U.S. Iraqi economy means oil. They don't, nobody cares about the asparagus they grow. So uh, the, it must be open to foreign investment, unlike other uh, countries which have controlled their own resources. Uh, and it must privilege U.S. investors. I mean, you know, that's more extreme than the most extreme war critic ever said. And Bush underscored it uh, in one of his many hundreds of signing statements a couple of months later in January. Uh, in which he said that he would, uh, he signed some legislation, but he said, I'm not going to live up to it. Uh, in fact, I'll, I won't live up to any legislation that uh, interferes with the U.S. goal of maintaining sort of permanent capacity for military operations there and uh, uh, controls the uh, energy resources. Well, that's totally different from Vietnam. It didn't, the U.S. didn't care. Once the country was destroyed, and Laos was destroyed and Cambodia was destroyed. The U.S. didn't care very much what happened, happy to pull out. This is just a completely different situation, both domestically and in terms of the geopolitics of it. I'm tempted to ask a follow-up, but I think I'll cede to the other people that are waiting for you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I really enjoyed your book, Manufacturing Consent, and uh, I was just curious. Uh, over the last couple of days, the mainstream media has uh, gotten behind uh, this irrefutable evidence that uh, North Korea has uh, built a nuclear reactor in Syria and uh, that Israel was able to uh, successfully wipe it out. I was kind of curious to hear your take on that and maybe cut through or yeah. cut through the propaganda. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. Actually, I've written about it a little. If you're interested, and I'll give you some references, but. Uh, I happened to be listening to NPR on the way in here, the evening news, and uh, you know they had a, one of their sober intellectual reports, uh, which was a perfect example of what John Burns was describing, how you have to cheer for the home team. It described about half the story. Uh, it said that uh, you know this, all of this is very interesting evidence that uh, North Korea isn't living up to its obligations, and then there are the hawks who say we should, you know, break up all, up all discussion and attack them or something, and the doves who say maybe we should give them a little more time and so on. Well, yeah, it's probably true that North Korea isn't living up to all its obligations and its declaration, but it's also true that the United States is not living up to its obligations. In fact, in the rare reporting on this that you can occasionally find, the last report was that uh, the, United, the original agreement was that Iraq would dismantle its nuclear facilities and 
produce a declaration of its nuclear activities, and the United States would uh, join with the other six powers in providing uh, Iraq with fuel, uh, with uh, uh, other aid, and the U.S. would enter into normal diplomatic relations and remove them from the uh, uh, remove the uh, isolation of North Korea by taking them off the list of states that support terror and so on. Well, the U.S. has done none of that. You know. Uh, furthermore, there's a history of this. Uh, the same negotiations, same agreement, pretty much, was reached in September 2005. Uh, North Korea agreed to dismantle, to end all nuclear weapons-related operations, all nuclear operations, end them all verifiably. And the United States, in return, uh, would uh, uh, enter into diplomatic relations, remove the threats to Korea, and provide it with a light water reactor and a couple of other things, uh, and end all threats. Okay, that would end the crisis. Uh, a couple of days later, the United States uh, carried out what the five NATO generals now call an act of war against North Korea. Uh, they closed down North Korean financial operations, which happened to be in a small bank in Macau. It was probably a trial run for what they're now doing against Iran to see how it would work. Well, you know, that's a very serious uh, attack on a country to isolate it from the international financial system. No exports, no imports, and so on and so forth. And it was almost certainly done in order to undercut the negotiations that had just been reached. And in fact, North Korea reacted as you'd expect carried out a nuclear test, you know, went on to develop missiles and so on. And that's been the history all the way back. Yeah, North Korea may have the worst government in the world, but they've been following a pretty pragmatic course on this. Uh, when the U.S. gets more aggressive, they get more aggressive. When the U.S. gets more conciliatory, they get more conciliatory. And uh, it's been running steadily all the way through. So that's the other part of the story. And there's another part of the story that's even more significant. Uh, I don't know if North Korea has been providing anything to S Syria or not, but there would have been an easy way to stop this, a very easy way. In 1993, North Korea and Israel were on the verge of an agreement uh, by which Israel would recognize North Korea and North Korea would terminate all weapons-related activities in the Middle East. Now, that would be very important for Israel's security. But the Clinton administration said no. They wouldn't let them do it. And when the Godfather speaks, you got to listen. So uh, that agreement was never reached. Uh, and if that agreement had been reached, we would not be having any discussion about uh, whether North Korea is doing anything in Syria or not. Well, that part of the story is knocked out. Now, it's not that it's secret. You know, if you do some research, or you read the arms control literature and so on, yeah, you can find it. Actually, I've written about it too, and have others. But it's certainly not the headline where it ought to be. It's not something that people know. Uh, another small point was made by uh, Andrew Cordesman, who's one of the leading uh, Middle East uh, security specialists in the United States, who suggested that maybe this whole flap is just a warning to Iran, uh, saying, you know, we got our eyes on you. Uh, and if you do anything, or even if you don't do anything, we'll pretend that you did and you're in trouble. You know? So yes, there's a lot to the story. But uh, exactly what's going on, we don't know and probably won't know until declassified documents come out someday if they ever do. Hi, I think you're, I've read your books and I think you're excellent. Um, my question is, most people, um, I mean, we can sit here and have a discussion on the problems that we've had um, in the past in Panama or Guatemala and Cuba, and we can also talk about how, you know, how we supported the Shah and we basically affected the Iranian revolution. But the fact is that most people in America don't even know that at one point we supported Saddam Hussein. So knowing this fact, how can we help educate the rest of the American public on all of these issues when it seems that, you know, the media won't do it and it's all of this information that you say is easy to find is maybe not so easy for the average person. So... Yeah. See, I, uh, first of all, let's talk, you're right about supporting Saddam Hussein, but very few people know the extent of the support. I mean, in 1982, Saddam Hussein was hanged a couple of months ago, or a year ago, whatever it was. 
And if you look, he was hanged for crimes that he committed in 1982. He was alleged to have uh, ordered the killing of 150 or so people, which by his standards was like, you know, toothpick on a mountain. But that's what he was judged for. But it was kind of interesting to see the uh, commentary on it. Something else happened in 1982. In 1982, the Reagan administration removed Iraq from the list of states supporting terror, which is a name for the list of states we want to go after. Uh, it's nothing to do with supporting terror. So they removed it from the list in order that the U.S. could start uh, providing aid and support to their friend Saddam Hussein. Uh, uh, Donald Rumsfeld went shortly afterwards to you know, sign the friendly agreement. And through the 1980s, the U.S. was one of a number of states who uh, supported, uh, gave support to Saddam Hussein. A lot of it was agricultural support, which he desperately needed, and it was a big boon to U.S. agribusiness, uh, but also uh, weapon support, you know, means to develop weapons of mass destruction and so on. This went on right through Saddam Hussein's worst atrocities, you know, the Halabja massacres, uh, uh, the, the Anfal massacres, you know, everything. Uh, use of chemical weapons it went all the way through. Not a, I mean, there was some protest. Congress protested now and then, but Reagan vetoed any effort to uh, do anything about it. Uh, George Bush, number one, came along. He was a particular admirer of Saddam. Uh, in 1989, at the very time of the invasion of Panama, just as the invasion of Panama was going on, uh, Bush overrode uh, the Treasury Department and authorized new aid to his friend, Saddam Hussein. The press cooperated by not reporting it. Uh, in, also in 1989, Bush uh, invited Ira Iraqi nuclear engineers to the United States to get advanced training in weapons production, nuclear weapons production. Okay, that's also 1989. Early 1990, uh, Bush sent a high-level senatorial delegation to Iraq led by Bob Dole, Republican the Senate Majority Leader, who was then presidential candidate a couple of years later. And the goal, the purpose of the delegation was to uh, send George Bush's uh, good wishes to his friend Saddam uh, to ensure him that he could disregard uh, the kind of protests he hears now and then from the American press. We have this free press thing here, and we can't shut all these guys up. And told him that he would, they would take off uh, from the Voice of America anybody who was criticizing him. That was generally a kind of love session. That was April 1990. Okay, a couple of months later, Saddam Hussein disobeyed orders, or maybe misunderstood orders, which is possible, and invaded Kuwait. Okay, he shifted instantly from favored friend and ally to reincarnation of Hitler. You know, you don't disobey orders. You know, and like I said, any mafia don understands. Uh, that's the support. And in incidentally, shortly after that, uh, Washington returned to support to, for Saddam Hussein. After the war, I mean, the war was a murderous, destructive war, you know, way beyond anything that was needed to get Saddam out of Kuwait. Uh, but right after the war, uh, by March 1991, the U.S. had total control, military control of the region, control of the air, everything. And there was a large Shiite uprising in the south which probably would have overthrown Saddam. Uh, but the U.S. authorized Saddam to crush it. They authorized him to use uh, aircraft, military helicopters, and so on to crush the uprising, killing probably tens of thousands of uh, Shiites in the south. Uh, uh, general, uh, what was his name, Schwarzkopf, who was a general, said later that he was fooled by Saddam. Uh, he didn't realize that when he authorized Saddam to use military aircraft, he'd actually use them. So kind of, you know, we were tricked. Uh, but uh, it was explained pretty open, pretty frankly, by the New York Times, the chief diplomatic correspondent, Thomas Friedman. The chief diplomatic correspondent means State Department spokesperson in the New York Times, just relays State Department propaganda. Uh, he said, uh, he wrote a clear column. He said, the, he said the best of all possible worlds, he supported the decision to allow Saddam to crush the uprising. Uh, he said, the best of all worlds for the United States would be an iron-fisted military junta ruling Iraq just the way Saddam did, but with a different name, because he's now kind of embarrassment. And so we have to settle for second best, you know, Saddam himself. 
uh, the Middle East correspondent for the New York Times, who's still there, still their top Middle East correspondent, uh, Alan Cowell, he said, well, you know, it's kind of unpleasant watching all these people get massacred. He said, but there's a, a, a consensus among the United States and its allies, namely Britain and Saudi Arabia, uh, that the uh, best hope for stability in Iraq is Saddam Hussein, not the people who are trying to overthrow him. Okay, so therefore we have to let Saddam crush the uprising that might have overthrown him. The stability ha is a technical term. It means following U.S. orders. Okay, so that's stability, and Saddam's more hopeful for stability than uh, Iraqis. In fact, what I've said is, you know, the worst possible outcome is that Iraqis might rule Iraq. We're not going to allow that. Uh, independent nationalism is not to be accepted. That's why Muqtada al-Sadr is a renegade and so on. And in fact, through the 90s, it's the same story. If you look at the main effect of the sanctions, Clinton's sanctions, I mean, they were murderous and destructive, but they strengthened Saddam Hussein. They undermined opposition to him. They compelled the population to rely on him for survival, which is probably the reason he wasn't overthrown. You know, otherwise, he probably would have had the same fate as uh, Ceausescu and Suharto and Mobutu and a whole bunch of gangsters, not very different from him, who the U.S. supported until the end. Uh, but, uh, in fact, that's exactly what was said by uh, Dennis Halliday and Hans von Sponek, the two uh, uh, directors of the uh, uh, Oil for Food program, who, as I said, knew more about Iraq than certainly any Westerner. So maybe so, you know, it's, uh, but it's crucial that Iraqis not rule Iraq. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, there was support. Now, how do we get any of this stuff to the American people? Well, you know, how do you get anything else to the population? Uh, was it you who quoted Margaret Mead at the beginning? Yeah, that's the way you do it. Uh, everything happens exactly the way you said. Exactly, in, uh, you know, take the civil rights movement, the, the women's movement, the, the anti Vietnam anti war movement. Pick anything you like. Uh, the, you know, the environmental movement it starts with small groups of people doing things and gradually it grows. And finally, it gets to the point where, uh, as in the case of the anti-Vietnam War movement, where the government was afraid to send troops because they'd need them for civil disorder control. All that happened within about two years. You know? uh, yeah. And it just changed the world. I mean, a striking example is the women's movement. You know, it's not that, I mean, there were feminists before, but until the 1960s, you know, there was nothing much was happening. Uh, and within a couple of years, it changed the, the country and the world dramatically. It's probably the major impact of the 60s on the world. And it happened just by consciousness raising groups, uh, bigger groups, uh, you know, ac activism wherever it was necessary, and so on. Uh, the civil rights movement was the same. A couple of black kids sat at a lunch counter and you know, some freedom fry. Bus riders started r riding, and you know, pretty soon you had a huge mass movement, which didn't solve the problems, obviously, but solved a lot of them, made it a lot better. All right, we only have time for one more question. Um, earlier you mentioned Latin America and the U.S. Um, preference for police states, and I think we see those police states crumbling. Um, preference for what? I didn't police catch. States police states. In Latin America. Um, and those states are crumbling. Uh, most recently, there was the election in Paraguay. And while we never heard anything about the generations of rulers in Paraguay, this, w this weekend there was a significant election. You know, we find Correa in Ecuador, who is saying that U.S. military bases have no place in Ecuador. Um, Venezuela, a revolution with resources, a rich revolution. Um, Evo Morales in Bolivia right now, as you know, is being threatened and that there is a worldwide um, appeal to, um, to seize the hostilities. Anyway, my question is, how do you see Latin America um, moving forward on its leftist path or just on its own path um, and defying the U.S.? I, this is one of the most important things happening in the world, I think. Uh, it's not Latin America, unfortunately, it's South America. Central America was so devastated by Reaganite terror, it may never recover. Uh, so they're not part of this much. I mean, a little, but not much. But South America is undergoing a really dramatic change. 
I mean, it's the first time since the Spanish invasions that the countries of South America are beginning to face two fundamental problems, which have turned them into a, like a horror story, you know, some of the worst poverty and misery in the world, in, in, a, in a region with enormous resources and a lot of potential. You know, it's not like, it's not like uh, you know, it's not a desert somewhere. Uh, the two problems are both problems of sort of disintegration. One of them internal to each society, another among all the societies. Uh, each Latin, uh, the Latin American societies typically have been run by a very small, wealthy, uh, very wealthy, largely white elite, race class correlations pretty close, uh, with a mass of suffering and misery. That's been an internal problem. Uh, so if you compare it with East Asia, it's striking. I mean, Latin America has many advantages over East Asia. It should be way ahead in development. But in Latin America, uh, capital is exported by the tiny rich elite. Uh, the imports are luxury goods so they can you know, live it up. Uh, their second homes are in the Riviera or someplace like that. The children go to school overseas. But they have almost nothing to do with their own population. No responsibility, they don't pay taxes, nothing. Uh, the disintegration among the countries is that they, they are all separated from one another. Like, there's very little interaction among them during the colonial period and even the period of independence. You can see that in the transportation systems and uh, almost everything. Well, those things are changing uh, strikingly. I think the most dramatic case is Bolivia, which is really impressive what happened. And you're right, uh, it's under a lot of threat now. The white elite that's always run the place is infuriated that they had a democratic election for the first time. And the US is just as infuriated. Uh, democratic elections are a real danger. Uh, but they had a remarkable democratic election in which the large majority of the population, mostly indigenous, uh, entered the political arena, elected someone from their own ranks, on crucial issues, you know, not uh, did you uh, make a mis you know, did you say some phrase that you shouldn't have said, uh, but on uh, real issues, uh, control of resources, uh, issues of cultural rights, of justice, and so on, and they won. And uh, they were not just uh, pushing a button on election day. These were continuing struggles, uh, control over water, all sorts of things, sometimes very bitter struggles. And they had developed mass popular organizations and they had a democratic election of a kind that is unimaginable in the United States or in the West altogether. Uh, and, and yes, now there's a serious effort to overturn it. This strong secessionist movement. We don't have documents, but I'm sure it's backed by the United States to try to support the rich, mostly white minority to pull out. And that happens to be where most of the natural resources are. And the majority wants to hold the country together and uh, you know, carry forward the uh, significant changes that are taking place. And there's also, and that's happening in the other countries too that you mentioned, including Brazil, the most important. And there's a lot of uh, integration going on. In fact, the whole region, almost the entire region, is sort of moving to the left. You know? uh, well, the U.S. had means of stopping this, two means, violence and economic strangulation. And both means have been severely weakened. Uh, Korea throwing out the Manta Air Base is a symbol of the weakening of the uh, weapon of violence. Uh, traditionally, the US, when anything like this happened, the US just carried out a military coup, or you know, instigated a military coup, installed a bunch of gangsters, and that was the end of it. Uh, it's, uh, but they can't do that now. The last time the US tried a military coup was uh, in Venezuela in 2002, where they did manage to, the US-backed military coup did manage to overthrow the government, but it was overturned within a couple of days. And there was huge protest all over Latin America, and the US had to back off. And they haven't been able to do it since. Uh, the economic strangulation is also weakened. Uh, the economic strangulation in recent years has been, uh, the instrument of it has been the IMF, your National Monetary Fund, which is basically a branch of the US Treasury. So the idea is you know, get the countries deeply indebted, to give impossible debts that they can never pay. Uh, the debts are not from the population, they're from the elites. The population didn't borrow the money and didn't gain anything from it. But the international rules are they're the ones who have to pay it. Okay, well that's being overcome. 
country after country, as, as the Argentine president put it, ridding ourselves of the IMF, restructuring the debts, repaying the debts. Argentina did it with the help of Venezuela. Brazil did it in its own way. And uh, the IMF is actually in trouble. It's not getting enough funding by debt repayment. Uh, so, so the, and in general, the method of economic strangulation is declining, partly because of the integration. The countries are working together. Uh, the standard U.S. line now, press, scholarship, and so on, is that uh, uh, there are two kinds. They have to admit that Latin America is moving left, but there's a good left and a bad left. Uh, the good left is uh, Lula and Brazil. Uh, the bad left is, of course, Chavez and Morales and maybe Correa. Uh, but in order to maintain that party line, you have to you have to be quick on your feet. For example, you have to overlook the fact that uh, one of the strongest supporters of uh, Chavez is Lula. It doesn't fit the party line, so it doesn't get reported. Uh, after Lula in Brazil, after he was his second, after he was reelected, his first act practically was to fly to Caracas uh, to support uh, Chavez in his electoral campaign and to uh, dedicate a joint Venezuelan uh, uh, Brazilian project. There's now more projects developing. Uh, shortly after that, there was a very important meeting of the Latin American presidents in uh, Cochabamba in Bolivia, a very important place. That's where the Bolivian revolution took off. That's where peasants began protesting the World Bank uh, U.S. programs to privatize water, uh, which means water's out of, con you know, people can't drink because they can't pay the cost. So they threw out, uh, they succeeded in throwing out the Bechtel Corporation and blocking the efforts. It wasn't easy. A lot of people got killed. Uh, that's Cochabamba. It's a real symbol. So that's where the Latin American presidents met. It was December 2006. And they made interesting plans, joint plans for a European Union type uh, integration and actually taking steps towards it. Uh, and the U.S. Is just doesn't have much that it can do about it. You know, it's lost its main weapons. Uh, now, there are plenty of internal problems to overcome, so it's not going to be an easy path. But this is the first time they're being seriously faced and, on the, and with the participation of substantial mass popular movements. That's the basis for democracy. It's one of the reasons why we don't have a functioning democracy. We don't have mass popular movements. So therefore, uh, uh, popular opinion can be mostly disregarded as it is. Uh, but they're overcoming that. It's a real model to look for. Uh, the U.S. is by no means giving up. Uh, you, you may have read in the paper a couple of days ago that uh, a training of uh, military officers is being shifted from the State Department to the Pentagon. Uh, that's been going on for some time now, in fact, but they finally reported it. That's quite significant. Uh, training within the State Department is at least theoretically under congressional supervision meaning that there are human rights conditionalities and so on. And once it moves into the Pentagon, it's just a black hole. They can do anything they want. Nobody ever looks. Uh, training and torture, or whatever you do. Uh, it's a weak control, but it's something. Uh, furthermore, training of Latin American officers is shot way up. Uh, the U.S. is trying very hard to recreate a Latin American officer corps that will be able to follow its orders. I think it's now higher than it's ever been through the Cold War years. And the purposes are explicit. The training is designed to combat what's called radical populism. Well, in the Latin American context, radical populism means uh, human rights activists, uh, union leaders, priests organizing peasants, uh, you know, anybody who gets in the way. And that's the explicit goal of the training of officers. And training of officers just doesn't mean just teaching them. It means providing them with technology and weapons and connections and so on. So the U.S. is certainly trying to recreate the weapon of violence and also the uh, economic weapons, but it's not as easy as it was. Uh, for one thing, there's much more protest here, which is a good thing. Uh, for another thing, there's the whole world has become more diverse. So uh, the, the uh, exporters in Latin America can now turn to China for uh, markets and China's investing. There are also South-South relations developing. So Brazil, South Africa, and India now have relations. Uh, all of this, these moves are very positive, I think, and could lead to uh, the basis for some kind of authentic independence and also for overcoming the enormous internal problems. Uh, so that's a, uh, these are all very hopeful signs, I think.